Hello. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for another session at the Southern Festival of Books. Thanks especially to Humanities TV. Um, I'm Christy Lynch, the nonfiction editor at BookPage, and I'm really thrilled to be here again this year. Um, today is the last day of the 2021 festival, so I hope you've all had a chance to enjoy some of the amazing author conversations that, that have taken place already this week. Um, I want to remind you that Parnassus is the official bookseller of the Southern Festival of Books, and when you purchase one of the great books that you hear about at the festival from Parnassus, it helps keep the festival free. So definitely keep doing that. Um, this festival is free and it is supported in part by donations from individuals. And so if you appreciate the event and you wanna support it, you can do so by visiting Humanity Tennessee's website and making a donation there. I'm here today with Kristen Radke, who is the author of the graphic nonfiction books, Imagine Wanting Only This, and most recently, Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness, which is a finalist for the 2021 Kirkus Prize. Um, she received a Whiting Creative Nonfiction Grant in 2019, and she's the art director and deputy publisher of the literature, arts, and culture magazine, The Believer. Um, Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thanks, Christy. Thanks for having me. Um, so for those who are watching today who maybe have not yet had a chance to read your book, do you want to start by telling us a little bit about what it's about? Sure. Uh, so CQ is kind of, a, the subtitle is A Journey Through American Loneliness, which like actually says it, uh, I think, sums it up. But it's um, basically in 2016, I started uh, thinking about loneliness a lot. And I kind of started asking questions about like, well, what is this feeling? And, and why am I sort of observing it? And why am I interested in it? And I started, I just kind of got obsessed with, um, the science of loneliness. And then I started really associating loneliness with, or, or kind of connecting loneliness to sort of tropes like, uh, American individualism or, or like the story of the cowboy and all and kind of the ways in which we, um, are pretty isolated from one another here. Mm -hmm. and kind of how that's rooted in our storytelling. And it kind of just took off from there. Mm. Yeah. Um, a lot. So you said you started thinking about it and maybe composing shortly thereafter in 2016, but it was published mm -hmm. this year um, in July mm -hmm. of 2021. And so a lot of people have commented on the timeliness of this book because yeah. it came out a year and some change into, you know, a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. Um However, many of the experiences of loneliness that you explore in the book don't necessarily have anything to do with actual physical isolation from other people. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how America's trademark loneliness is different from the loneliness people may have experienced, you know, during the pandemic? Definitely, definitely. So I, I, um, I was finishing the book up when... Uh, I live in New York and, you know, after Seattle, New York was, was hit f first. And we, so we were on, it was sort of that phase when no one understood anything that was happening. And I was finishing the, the edits to the book, like when we were on lockdown and really the only sounds that I heard were sirens. And there's a hospital in my corner that converted into a COVID hospital and they erected tents. I mean, it was like a really horrible period and, and a period in which we started all talking about loneliness and isolation right away. Mm -hmm. And I, we had, I had a lot of conversations with my editors about like, do I need to address like the loneliness of a pandemic more? And in the end, I, I mean, I wrote an introduction about it, but I, I chose not to, because I think that the loneliness of like an imposed loneliness, like a, of a global pandemic, for example, is um, very different from the problems of chronic loneliness that are um, a lot more difficult to pinpoint and understand. And I think that's one of the reasons that loneliness can be so painful is you can't even necessarily explain why you feel the way you feel uh, or, or you feel like it, there's a, some kind of personal failing. Um, but I do feel like the, 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 my one hope for the pandemic is that we have learned more how much we need each other as human people and that we're all really responsible for each other and, and responsible mm -hmm. for the health of our communities. Mm -hmm. Um, you write about loneliness as an evolutionary stress response. Mm -hmm. 
meant to pull us back into our communities because of yes. course, for most of human history, it was dangerous to be mm-hmm. alone. Um, earlier in history, uh, those dangers might have looked like predators or mm-hmm. the element or you know, scarce resources. Uh, but now that we are living in a time when a lot of people, of course, not everyone um, can access food and shelter and mm-hmm. survive, even if they're alone, um, are there still contemporary reasons why being alone is dangerous? Do you think that this stress response of loneliness is still useful or it, is it telling us something different now? Yes. I mean, it's a great, really complicated question, but it's a great question. So um, basically, uh, like you said, loneliness is a stress response. It's something released in our brains because it's dangerous to be alone. You have to get back to another person. So you have like backup if something goes wrong um, and because you need each other to survive. So even if it's not just about predators, it's about like we share resources, we do all these things. And this is what, like, this is what we need. And that's still true basically, even though we have like grocery stores and, you know, all of these things that make it, fe- make life feel a lot more automated um, the problem, the, the thing about that is if we have, so we have this stress hormone that builds up in our brains, basically, and are in our bodies. And in evolutionary times, that the, the point of that was it built up really quick. So you, it triggered a response and then you weren't alone anymore. And then you like yeah. sought other people out and you connected. And today, that's even before COVID, that's not exactly how things work. Like you might feel kind of lonely, but continue to just like sit behind your computer or to live in your you know, apartment alone and not, and not have an, a, an avenue to see people out. And so then when loneliness, when that hormone builds up over time, it becomes really dangerous um, to our bodies and to our mental health and to our ability to connect. So when you're in that state for too long, you can enter a, a state, like what scientists called hypervigilance, mm-hmm. which um, makes you less likely uh, to, and less open to new relationships. Like it causes you to sort of see people you don't know as threatening rather than like as opportunities to connect with, with other people. So we get caught in this, in this cycle sometimes. Um, I think we all, when, whenever I talk about this, people are always like, I have a, you know, that makes me think of this one family member or something like that. I definitely have people like that in my life. Um, And it's, it's this, it's this really horrible, tragic thing, especially because, um, chronic loneliness is really dangerous for our bodies physically. Like when we're uh, lonely for a long time, we're less likely to fight infection, fight disease. We're more likely to have heart attacks, more likely to um, get cancer. Like there are all of these things that um, statistically, if you're chronically lonely, you die sooner than people who feel socially fulfilled. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) That is very dangerous. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Uh. So there are examples in your book of technologies that have been designed to mimic our experience of connection. Mm -hmm. Um, Everything from the invention of the laugh track for TV sitcoms, making us feel like we are sharing in this experience Mm -hmm. of laughing together, um, battery operated babies that they give to nursing home patients to Mm -hmm. sort of help them feel more alert um, and the professional cuddling industry. Yes. Um, what's interesting is that all of these things are effective at making us feel less lonely, even though they aren't real. Real. <laughs> um, do you think, I don't know, does that make them disturbing or is it encouraging? Is it something else? How do we I mean this? I Another amazing question. I mean, I don't have an answer because I think it's very subjective. Like I think, and I, I go back and forth on kind of how I feel about it because I think there is a way to just sort of like cast a dispersion and be like, certainly like people should not have companions who are robots. Certainly people should have (laughs) companions who are humans, you know, but then it's like, also like that there's something kind of judgmental about that. Like, I think I confronted my own judge like I had to confront my own judgment in, in throughout the book a lot to understand what loneliness was, to understand and overcome like preconceived notions of what we believe loneliness to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then think, I think more broadly about solutions and understand that a solution for me and a solution for someone else are different. And like, that doesn't make what works for somebody else, even if that doesn't work for me, it, it's not my place to say that's wrong. Cause it's, mm-hmm. it's just not. Um, 
so I don't know. I mean, I'm very fearful of a world in which we um, need to pay someone to like hold us instead of, you know, forming a relationship where we have someone we can cuddle with. Like, um, and, and, but at the same time, relationships come in so many different ways and everyone's needs are so different. I think maybe there, there is, I, I just, I don't think that, I don't think we even know enough about loneliness to understand the implications now of like these, these new waves of how we handle it. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, I think like a hundred years from now, I hope that we will have a much clearer explanation and hope, and hopefully it won't be like, we all got robots for best friends and the <laughs> human race ended. <laughs> yeah. If I remember correctly, you, you said that it wasn't until 2016 that they even discovered the part of the brain yeah. that is responsible for or activated during experiences of loneliness and so yeah seems and like that was and they identified that in my in mice mm. um and so like when it was re- it, when it's removed they started doing tests where they you know not ideal testing the animals but when they are removed mm. from animals they um like they don't uh they don't let out distress calls when they're separated from each other or they ignore mm. their children things like that yes <laughs> very uplifting (laughs) but important I mean there are a lot there are a lot of um things that you explore in this book that are like really heavy to read about um but like un but have undeniably advanced our understanding of like how much we need each other so it's complicated that's that's it is complicated yeah the mice with no loneliness receptors is a great example of that um so uh so what about the internet, which is the ultimate simulation of connection. Um, Do you think connection through the internet is ever an effective substitute for connection in real life as we sit here speaking to each other over the internet? I think the internet is a tool and any tools can be misused or overused. Like, so I think also because the internet is so young, we don't know enough yet. I mean, like I, um, I'm an elder millennial. Like I, I am, uh, I got the internet, you know, when I was like in middle school or something like that, you know? So like, we're just now kind of seeing people move into like solidly adulthood who've been raised on the internet their whole lives. You know, I think we have, we need, we just need more time to understand the kind of the implications. But I do think if we think of the internet, like a tool, the same way that like the telephone is a tool. Mm. Um, there are certainly ways to misuse those tools and there are certainly ways to use them as supplements that, that keep us connected. I mean, I think a lot of us had um, Zoom dates and stuff during COVID that felt made us feel less alone. And those mm. things are really valuable. You know, I have a, a good friend who's a caretaker for his mother who has a um, disease that keeps her housebound. Uh, mm. And the, the internet for him, for them is essential. Like she doesn't, she can't, she can't go to community gathering spaces in the way that someone who has uh, mobility, better mobility can. So I think like, it's really easy for us to cast like a wide net and be like, the internet's ruining everything. And in a lot of ways, yeah, the internet's ruined a lot of things, but it's also helped a lot of people or people who are geographically removed from each other or, um, you know, like a person of color who lives in like a white homogenous town you know I have I hear those stories all the time so I think that um every new technology I think we sort of think it's the end of the world like I have this quote in the book but the New York Times wrote this review or like this editorial about the telephone when it was invented and they said something like we will soon become nothing but transparent heaps of jelly to each other (laughs) which is hilarious and like an amazing line but you know the telephone in the end connected us to each other much more than than before yeah, I mean that was that was a really interesting moment in the book where you sort of create this timeline of different technologies that they've developed and how everybody's yeah. people, you know, society's response to like the yeah. train when yeah. the train was, yeah. you know, when railroads were built <laughs> trans- yeah. transcontinentally, people were yeah. like, "Well, now you're just going to be able to run away from each other," and it's gonna- which is totally true. Yeah. And but you can also run towards each other, you know, mm-hmm. like. But there are ways in which. Um, if we look at like anthropology, humans really are not supposed to migrate unless they go together. And there is something like one of the reasons now that we are experiencing these new kinds of loneliness is that 
in the grand scheme of human history, we stuck together a lot more than we do now. I mean, now we're, we move for a job or we do all these things, you know, that, that just didn't happen. Um, even a hundred years ago was happened less than it does now, you know? Um, and so there's no denying that that has caused us to change the way our communities work and that that has caused a lot more loneliness with that, with that kind of opportunity. Mm. Um, it's also caused opportunities for people who felt lonely where they were to find, you know, a community that suited them better. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's complicated. It's really complicated. <laughs> Almost like it's not all good or bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, so you spent some time uh, in the book exploring the gendered aspects of loneliness. Mm -hmm. We touched on a little bit earlier. Um, such as, you know, the masculine anti-hero trope who is superior in his loneliness because mm -hmm. he is self-sufficient, mm -hmm. like Cowboys, John Wayne, or, you know, Don Draper, mm -hmm. um, but also the uh, isolated princess trope who yeah. is waiting to be rescued, like a Princess Diana or Cinderella, mm -hmm. whose friends are only birds and mice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um it was so interesting, and I, I'm curious how you think we came to romanticize these kinds of lonely characters, especially when there are so many biological imperatives for us to reject loneliness instead of coming to admire it somehow. I think um, there's a lot of... Uh, these questions are amazing because they're like, they could go a million different ways. There's like some of the most thoughtful questions I've ever been asked, but um, oh gosh, wow. <laughs> they, they um, I'm trying to live, I'm trying to um, do them justice with my answers. But um, I think a lot of reasons. One, I think like no one wants to, I think readers and viewers are lonely people, just like all people are lonely people. You know, we all, ex we all know what, what experiencing lonely loneliness feels like. And who wants to watch a show where like every like or a movie where like someone's like totally fulfilled and completely popular and their life is all worked out like there's something about a quest and like a quest for connection is a meaningful i mean like the whole romantic comedy genre is surrounded by a quest for you know a relationship or um community sometimes too like in certainly in the um like princess tropes they like join a whole new kingdom or something like that um, but I think like there's, I think the gendered reasons are the way that loneliness is portrayed in across gender is the same way that kind of like everything is portrayed across gender. Mm -hmm. Like there's something that like loneliness in women is like a weakness where in a man it's like it's a strength. I mean, that's something we see played out across a million categories. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's also something where, uh, women who are lonely are portrayed as sort of pathetic if they're, unless they're like a princess who's been like locked in the castle, yeah. um, particularly if she's a little bit older. And mm -hmm. then where um, a male antihero is kind of like sexy and brooding. And I think that kind of also goes back to like the cowboy. I my One of my theses in the books about that is that everything goes back to like the, prin the woman is the princess and then the man is a cowboy. And that's kind of where like all of the storytelling has, has come from is from those two, you know, old fashioned ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Not, helpful but not prevalent. ideal <laughs> prevalent and just stubborn yeah um so uh this is um you know a graphic work it is illustrated um and your illustrations in the book are so haunting um which i do mean as a compliment <laughs> <laughs> Because, I mean, of course, they're really, they're really effective. They're really moving. Um, and especially in cases of people's and animals' facial expressions, um, they are very, they can be very gut punching. Um, which, Sorry about that. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, what do you expect picking up a book about yeah. this? You kind of got to buckle up a little bit, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's those are just some of the ways that this work is probably more effective as a graphic work than if it had been in all text format. Um, but I'm wondering what, what aspects of creating work in a graphic form did you hope would make it more powerful um, because of that element? Um, I, 
I don't think I had a hope that it would make it more powerful. I think it's just, that's just the way that I process ideas. And so I never really been considered making it in another form. Mm. Um, I do think like it was a challenge to figure out like, how do I continue to represent loneliness? That's not just like a person alone in an empty room. Like they're like looking off into, you know, like there's like, there's like certain, so it was interesting to try to like overcome like the sort of visual cliches of loneliness. Not that some of those images aren't still in the book. Cause I also think it's like cliches are cliche for a reason. And mm. I think we, um, we recognize them and, and that's also kind of important to our cultural understanding to, to represent them in a, if, if I'm studying the, the history of loneliness in America. Mm. Um, but so I don't know. I mean, I hope I hope that the form works for people, but it was it was really just the way that it kind of came out of me. Yeah, um, I've been I, I was trying to um, research if other graphic works have been nominated for the Kirkus Prize before. I don't know if you know, I couldn't. Find I think the fir I think Raz Chast maybe won the, like the first one or something yeah. like that. But I think I'm not sure if anyone else. Um, I've just been wondering if because, you know, it's being, it's reaching a, a pretty, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm speculating, but I, I, I would speculate that um, it, it seems to be reaching um, a pretty literary audience. And I yeah. wonder how much experience some of those readers have reading other graphic works um, uh, who are coming to this work, maybe as inexperienced graphic readers. Um, yeah. I wonder, what, what do you think people should know about reading um, graphic works if they're not an experienced reader of that form? Um, I think uh, they should just do it. Like, I think that there's this, I, the thing that kind of annoys me about the way that we categorize books, and I know it's totally essential to sell them and to market them mm -hmm. and to categorize them in a bookstore and in a library. Like, I understand why, but I, I also don't want us to use those categories as um, reasons to not pick up other books. Mm -hmm. Because, like, I... Um, for forever, I was like, I only want to read when I was becoming a, a reader. I was like, I only want to read memoirs and nonfiction. And it's like, well, I was missing on all these amazing novels, you know? And then I was like on a novel and I was like, I only want to read novels like about women protagonists, you know? And like, <laughs> you go through these phases where you just miss things then. Mm -hmm. But I think graphic books are, it's just another way of organizing ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think we have sometimes preconceived notions about like comics being like only superheroes or only, um, you know, like, very uh, like like com like dime store kind of comic books and there's so many different kinds of graphic storytelling mm -hmm. um and i think it can be a really great experience even if you're not um if it's not something you normally turn to mm. well <laughs> i would tend to agree but uh <laughs> i yeah i've been um there's been a lot of reports about graphic um works i don't know all of the book selling information that came out um, during the pandemic, one of the takeaways was how much more popular graphic works were than I think a lot of publishers Interesting. had realized up until that point. Yeah. So there's been a lot more. They've been, it seems, entering the mainstream in a way yeah. that we have, had not um, previously at the same level. So I think that's yeah. good. I hope so. Um, uh, something that I uh, thought about a lot as I was reading this was um, the way that color creates mood throughout the book um in a way that i have to imagine would be difficult to create the same yeah, effect it sucked. It totally sucked it was so hard <laughs> oh okay well that's too bad um, <laughs> no it's okay i mean um, making a book is hard in general yes but. i have heard this um uh yeah i how did you decide on this particular color palette? It is extremely moody and, and appropriate for the material, but it's it, it seems like it would be hard to to discover that correct combination. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I think it was harder for me than for a lot of comics artists because I just don't, like color doesn't, doesn't make sense to me inherently the way that I think it does for some artists. Like when I see the way that some artists use color, it's just like, I could just like sink into <laughs> it and like, you know, like flow through it forever. And I stared at a lot of their books, I think, when I was trying to figure out how to use color. And I was so overwhelmed. And then my friend, um, Maxwell Neely Cohen, who's also a great novelist, he uh, bought me this little tiny book of color palettes, like this big. Mm -hmm. And um, it's Japanese. And I just, like, I was on a plane at the time. 
And I remember like looking through it and seeing all these beautiful little squares of colors together. And I was like, it like this whole sense of calm came over me and I was like, okay, I can figure this out. And I, I didn't, it's not like I used any palettes from the book, but there was something about it that just like flipped a switch in me to understand that like, I don't have to use all the colors in the world on one page. Like it can just be like three or four. And I just have to figure out how they communicate with one another because like language it's, is a kind of another kind of language. It's it, color. Mm -hmm. And it's saying something and, and I have to, you just have to understand what it's saying. And that takes time. Mm -hmm. And then when you have like one color here and then you add another color here, like this color becomes changed and mm -hmm. like the, because by the relationship between the two. So it's just, it was just for me about going really slowly. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. It, I mean, it was really effective. I, I don't know anything about color or art or anything, but just as a reader, it really. Um, Good. I'm glad it washes over you when you read it. <laughs> um, I, I uh, realized a moment ago that I did not tell the audience that if they have a question for you, they can type it into the chat. <laughs> and so please, if you have a question, you want to hear more about something that we're talking about, go ahead and type your question and um, we'll definitely get around to those before the end of our chat today. So just wanted to mention that before we go, we get too much farther into our chat today. Um, Okay, when I, whenever I try to describe your book to people, <laughs> if I'm recommending it to them, I end up feeling like uh, Stefan from Weekend Update. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm just like, this book has everything. There's <laughs> monkeys, there's cowboys, there's attachment theory, there's prestige television. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I have to imagine that there were other topics that you yeah. searched that um, ended up falling outside of the scope for this project. But um, yeah, I'm wondering if, if there are any of those other things that didn't make it in, but that you still think about um, that might be interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot about robots, actually. I read a lot of books about robots and technology. And then I didn't want to folk, I didn't want to make it a book about technology because I think there are problems with loneliness go beyond technology, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah. But I think about that a lot. I think I also um, am still thinking a lot about like language and communication and how mm -hmm. that impacts or the lack thereof and how that impacts loneliness. Um, and a lot of that stuff did not go in the book, but I'm still thinking about it now, actually. That's kind of what my next book is turning into. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, for me, the research is the most fun part of a project. Like I, it's where I learned I mean, it's where I literally learn the most and, and mm -hmm. it's where like real discovery can happen and I can feel really excited. So I also just like try to stay in that phase as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, so I tend to read like super widely and then, um, and then, you know, winnow over time. I also read a lot about boredom. I became very interested in boredom. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, uh, okay. Someone has asked, uh, how long it took you to finish the book, um, which I have also wondered about and is related to one of my forthcoming questions. So let me go ahead and ask you how long. Um, it was like three or four years, which is for me very, very, very fast. Like I'll never, I don't think I'll ever make a book in that time again. Wow. How long did you spend on your first book? At least almost 10 years, I think. I think like seven or something Ooh. like that. Wow. Um, I mean, drawing takes forever and yeah. it's like, you kind of have to make the book twice. Mm. And then in my case, when you redraw the whole thing or rewrite the whole thing, you make it like six times, you know? So, yeah. um, I, but this book, just like, I kind of understood what I, what this book was going to be. I feel like from the beginning kind of, which is very rare for me. Usually I'm completely wrong about what mm. a book project is going to be. And then you refine it over time because you, you get smarter as you go, I think. Mm. Um, uh, there, uh, there are a lot of concise, quickly constructed little turns of phrase in the book that struck me, um, as very poetic, uh, when I was reading them. And I imagine that there are some parallels between writing poetry and writing text for a graphic work because of, um, the limited space for text, um, but I am curious, do you take any inspiration from poetry when you are working on a graphic work? Um, 
Not really, but I love poetry. I, um, I mean, that's very nice of you to say. Um, I know, but I, I do, I do really love poetry, particularly like, um, documentary poetry or like something that has a, a real like outward facing quality to it. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I thought for sure that maybe you <laughs> wrote poetry on the side. <laughs> no, like, uh, Fortunately for poetry, I do not uh, <laughs> write poetry on this side. That's fair. Um, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, and as uh, listeners probably have gleaned, uh, uh, the experience of reading this book can be heavy. It is about loneliness <laughs> and all of its uh, you know, periphery. Um, and I have to imagine that the experience of writing it at times could also be heavy. Um, I'm curious if while you were writing it, you developed any routines or resources uh, to, you know, create comfort or connection um, that made yeah. it easier to write a whole book about feeling lonely. <laughs> I mean, I like, I do feel like the writing the book made me feel feel less lonely because it helped me understand what loneliness mm. is and like that it's this biological tool and it's this mm. very universal feeling that pretty much everyone feels or has felt. Um, mm. So for me, like the, the process of writing it was um, I think less emotionally difficult than like difficult in terms of labor and time. Mm. And it was just, um, and it, but it felt to me like I was understanding things that I have been like questions that I've been asking my whole life because I was like finding the solutions either through research or then through like synthesizing the research through my own experience. So for me, it was, um, it was more of a hopeful process, I think. Mm. And I do think the book is a, like, I, I know that there is some darkness in the book, but to me it is a, a hopeful book. And that's mm. the message behind the book is like that we can still find our way back to each other and that we, to me, the book is sort of like a love song to community and how much we owe each other as, as human beings. Yeah. I mean, that by uh, reading about animal experimentation, heavy, uh, yeah. take things that like, um, that like, just that, her, you know, just at, as early as, you know, the 20th century or as recently as the 20th century that, um, people thought that it was dangerous to like touch and be close to like your baby. Your baby. Um, and how, of course, now just a short time later, that is ridiculous. And we know that yeah. that's so psychically damaging. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, the path to get to some of these um, realizations is, is kind of harrowing, but I, yeah. but I agree that the, the conclusions and the takeaway are, uplifting and encouraging for um connection and community and interdependence. yeah and if not uplifting then I still like I I don't know I don't think everyone will find it uplifting I mean I do but I'm a weird person but I think I hope that it people read it still as like a hopeful book or that it, it helps them remember to to make to reach out to each other mm. um something that I thought about a lot reading it because of my particular context you know I'm this is the Southern Festival of Books. I'm coming to you from Nashville, Tennessee. I grew up in Alabama. I come from, you know, a Southern culture and context, which means for many people who grew up in the South that they were religious by default growing up, especially Christian growing up. Um, and um, a lot of folks, I'm also an elder millennial, and um, a, lot, a lot of folks who grew up in a Southern context um, have sort of uh, separated from those cultures, religious cultures growing up. But um, I think that there's a particular kind of loneliness in that experience Definitely. because there, totally. are so, there are so few um, communities that are intergenerational the way that yes. communities are. And um, that is, I don't know that we have arrived at a, a good sort of substitute for um, just, you know, secular or humanist or just sort of vaguely non-religious ways to connect with people of different ages besides families and yeah. like churches or synagogues or temples. Yeah. Or yeah, totally. I mean, I think that's so, um, like one of the books I talk about in, in, in my book is Bowling Alone, which was, um, 
which was by um, uh, this a writer called uh, his last name is Putnam, and he mm. he was basically saying the same thing that like um, our community centers have fallen away. Mm. Things like um, bowling leagues, PTAs. Uh, the bridge club, you know, like my grandmother, when she was young, went to bridge every week. Like my, my mother doesn't do that now. Yeah. Um, so there are these really big shifts. I mean, there are ways I think we can reframe community and also like those, there were, there were problems with those communities too. A lot of those were really exclusionary. Mm. A lot of those, you know, depended on a, a certain set of criteria, but, mm. um, and, and a lot of, and just because those spaces happened doesn't mean that people felt that they could be themselves or really express themselves or, or get like emotional support there. And I think we have gotten better at that. Like we've destigmatized a little bit, like mm. um, oversharing or like talking about unpleasantness. You know, I think we're a little bit better at accepting that that's a really important part of friendship. Mm. Um, but we are those community centers. I mean, it's really hard to find a place to gather that's not around like spending money. You know, there's like, there's no place to just go and like all be together. I think I felt we felt that I felt that a lot in New York during the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And it was kind of amazing because I, we're, we're, we're hoping it stays now. It's like this big battle in New York of we they blocked off some streets to turn them into like pedestrian only areas. Mm -hmm. And they're wonderful. Like there are these it's like the town square. And, wow. um, you know, like everyone who's like, I need to park my car. It's like very upset. But we like we need spaces like this to to gather, which doesn't mean that you have automatically have a group to join there, um, yeah. which is still the problem. But we do need we do need areas where like communities can come together um, and even just like casually talk because mm -hmm. because even those those sort of um, casual relationships are important. Mm. Um, yeah. And something that Though, of course, you know, we're, we're talking about the sort of not quite facsimile of community on the Internet and how mm -hmm. the Internet, of course, um, uh, makes opportunities for connection more accessible for people who are maybe disabled or who are isolated from mm -hmm. communities of like uh, minded people or people with the same mm -hmm. experiences. Um, it is it is not the same as um, being together in person. Uh, what are some what are some of the main ways that you think um, the internet sort of fails to recreate that experience um, as effectively? Well, like physical touch is really important, and I don't just mean romantic touch. I mean like platonic. You know, like you make a joke, someone makes a joke, and you like hit them on the shoulder, and it feels nice. Like it feels nice to connect in those ways, and like hugs and all these things that are really important. And I talked to some. Actually, that's one thing that didn't um, make it as much into the book as I talked to a lot of touch mm -hmm. therapists. I mean, I write about touch in the book, but I I thought I would talk about touch therapy, and I just it just didn't find a way in the book. But mm -hmm. um, like touch is essential to us um, to our health. Mm. And, and, um, to us, like our ability talking, going back to like hormones to, to produce like the good hormones that make that kind of propel us through our day. Mm. So th those things like that also like opportunity for like happenstance. And, um, I think is really important when you like share a physical space with someone or, or where you enter a physical space with someone in a way that it doesn't, ha doesn't quite happen like that on the internet. Mm. No, indeed. <laughs> uh, even in, the chat rooms of the early yeah. 2000s, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, as much fun as that was. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, there are a lot of assumptions in our culture, as you mentioned, talking about the, you know, the, the storytelling uh, tool of romantic comedies in particular, mm -hmm. uh, but there's this narrative about how romantic partnership is the best antidote to loneliness. Yeah. Um, but one of the through lines of your book that you kind of come back and just touch on, um, you know, throughout is this idea that maybe actually we are all, we are always lonely, um, whether mm -hmm. we are partnered or not. And in fact, maybe the Internet has not exacerbated our loneliness in recent years, like many people have said, but maybe we have always been lonely um, yeah. in our own way. Um, are there any steps that you think we can take toward accepting loneliness as part of being human or would that even be helpful? I think it, I think accepting loneliness is important for a lot of reasons. One, it makes you not feel ashamed when you feel it. And shame is like the absolute 
most crippling feeling I think we can feel it like paralyzes mm. us um, and keeps us from, from moving forward. Um, so I think that's really important. Also accepting that it's an important tool and that when you're feeling lonely, you should reach out to someone and like learning to listen to that, I think is really valuable. Mm. Um, but I also think it's about reframing our values around time. And um, so like, there was, I forget which study it was. It was something I saw recently where um, they found that like Americans in particular, wh what they say they value is extremely different from what they're willing to invest time into. And so mm -hmm. like something like six in 10 people said that um, friendships were essential for a meaningful life. And then something like only like two or three in 10 said they consistently made enough time, made time for their friend, for friendships. Yeah. And it's like French relationships are work. You have to put time and energy into maintaining them, mm -hmm. not just like a marriage, but, but also your, your platonic friendships. Like those are essential things that need to be nourished. Mm -hmm. And they also make you better. Um, feel, like they make you feel more connected and they make you feel loved. And, and they, they're also really helpful in like understanding the world and, and, um, ex understanding your own experience and getting support in those ways. So I think it's very important, especially when culturally over time, more and more we have um, put so much, um, we've sort of prized so much romantic relationships as sort of like the mm. most crucial relationship in one's life. And certainly that's true for a lot of people, but you, but one single person is rarely going to be enough um, to have all of your sort of um, emotional and interpersonal needs met. So it's really important that we not um, prioritize that at the expense of a larger community. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of pressure yeah. <laughs> for one person. Um, uh, something that I like to ask um, uh, authors who are also illustrators um, is whether, so, you know, um, there are some spreads in this book that are, um, so detailed and interesting, and especially the ones where there's um, uh, like recreations of headlines and things from mm -hmm. different uh, publications, you know, through the years. And I feel like I could just sit and look at them forever and not notice all the all the details. Um, and sometimes I wonder whether, uh, because of the detailed nature of some of these illustrations, there are any Easter eggs uh, <laughs> and that you have uh, included that are meaningful, maybe just to you or maybe to somebody who might be in the know, um, or if you if you just played it straight. <laughs> I mean, like I, um, I don't think Easter eggs per se, but I think there's a lot of details probably that no one sees because I just get, I get a little bit too focused, I think on the tiny details. And I also draw mm -hmm. digitally so I can like zoom infinitely and like see everything, you know, at, like really large scale, um, that is, is going to print quite small. But mm -hmm. I, um, you know, like people who know me will like see my cat show up and like recognize <laughs> that it's my cat, even though I don't like specifically mention my cat in the book. So I think that's actually one of the really pleasurable parts of, of a graphic book is you can fill out a, a room or something like that in a way that it would be really distracting or arduous mm -hmm. if, if it was like in a traditional prose book, because mm -hmm. you don't need to know like what art is on the walls and like every book that's on a shelf and like if there's like a sock on the floor. <laughs> you know, to move a plot forward. I mean, yeah. so for some time, if the sock is very important to the story, maybe you do, but, mm -hmm. um, but you can, so you can kind of fill out the spaces without it, without it slowing down a story, which is what I, which is one of the things I really love about reading um, graphic yeah. novels. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it's fun. It's really fun. Um, okay. Well, we're just about out of time. <laughs> I just realized. Um, oh, is there... <laughs> Anything else? I mean, I, I wanted to let, if, make sure everybody knows that if you have not read this book yet, I really encourage you to go and pick it up after this, put it on hold at your library or buy it from Parks. Um, I think we may even have a link to buy it in the chat. I'm not 100% sure because I didn't check before <laughs> this video, but look in the chat, there might be a link to buy it from Parnassus. Um, Okay, there is a link. Yay, click on it and buy it. It's really great. Um, thank, you. thank you so much for talking. Uh, you are so smart and your book is so good. And thank you. Just a delight. Thank you for your amazing uh, questions. Oh, it is my pleasure. Thank you again. And thanks everybody for watching. Thanks.